I, there's a different aspect of Christmas that I'd like to explore today, and this has to do with the nativity. You'll see here our nativity scene, which is Joseph and Mary and the Christ child here in the manger. There's some shepherds and an angel. And we've talked about this before, and uh, as far as the wise men and the angels and so on. But today, we're going to be looking at uh, one of the characters in this scene here, and it's not Jesus. This today is going to be, um, this message is inspired by a relatively new Christmas song that was written in 1984 by Mark Lowry and put to music in 1991 by Buddy Green and is one of the biggest Christmas songs that there are now, which is uh, Mary Did You Know. And maybe you're sick and tired of hearing that, and maybe you just love it every time you hear it. I don't know. People are all over the spectrum on this, but uh, it has become one of the most popular Christmas. It's not really a carol because it doesn't lend itself very well to going and standing in front of somebody's house and singing to them. It's more of a contemplative, meditative kind of a song. And it asks really deep questions of Mary, not really expecting an answer from Mary, but in the author asking Mary, did you know? He's, he's asking Mary, what was the state of her heart and the state of her mind through the entire um, conception and raising up of the Christ child? And these are good questions to ask. So um, I have, uh, as many of us do, I have a background in the Roman Catholic Church. And I want to be uh, very clear today that this message is not about raising up uh, Mary to be uh, a person that we would say pray to at this point. We don't pray to Mary. But also I'm concerned um, for myself, speaking for myself, that I don't want to downplay the role of Mary as a great hero of the faith. Mary is, a, is an example to all of us, uh, as we see also that, that Zacharias was an example to all of us, as John the Baptist was an example to all of us. We don't pray to them. We don't pray to Elizabeth. Um, and so I don't want to be shy about teaching about Mary and about looking at the life of Mary just because there are some aspects of it, perhaps in my background and in yours, that would make us a little bit uh, sensitive about that. So today we'll be in Luke chapter 1 mostly, and then also in John chapter 2 a bit. And we're going to look at this life of Mary. Now Mary was probably very young. Some say as young as 14 years old when she was first betrothed to Joseph. It would have taken maybe about a year for Joseph to build onto his father's house and then to come and claim his bride. And she would be perhaps, and this is all guesswork, about the age of 15. She could have been 16 or 17. We don't know. But probably a teenager in that time and culture. This marriage takes place in the region of Galilee. And that's very important because of the culture of Galilee and uh, the way that weddings were done, the way that marriages were done in Galilee. And we see that Mary was, uh, she was poor. I'll just give this by way of preference, uh, preface, that when Joseph and Mary went to the temple to offer the sacrifice to present their male child to the Lord, there were two different sacrifices that they could have offered. One is if they could afford it, they would bring a lamb for sacrifice. But they brought two turtle doves instead. Why would they bring two turtle doves instead of a lamb? They couldn't afford a lamb. So this is evidence to us that this is not a wealthy family, that this is a family of very humble, very modest means. So I don't want to call her a peasant, but she's definitely not from a rich family. And so who is this this Mary, and what is her character? We're going to be looking at that today. And then the title today is, Mary, Did You Know? Or, What Did Mary Know, and When Did She Know It? 
And we'll look at why that's important for us as well. Before we begin, I want to define the words, no, the word no, and then also the word believe, because no and believe are two different things. Mary, did you know? Merriam's Webster Dictionary, the Merriam Webster Dictionary, says that to know is to perceive directly, to have direct cognition of, to have an understanding of, to recognize the nature of, to recognize as being the same as something previously known. In other words, you knew something in the past and you recognize it again here so you feel like you know this thing now. To be acquainted with or familiar with, to have experience of, to be aware of the truth or factual out factuality of a matter. And that is different than the word believe. You know, the, the song doesn't say, Mary, did you believe? It asks, Mary, did you know? And But belief is going to come into our message today as well. So belief is, in the Webster's Dictionary, to consider something to be true or honest, to accept the word or evidence of a thing, or to hold something as an opinion, to accept something as true, to have, another way of saying this is to have a firm or wholehearted religious conviction or persuasion about a matter, and to regard the existence of God, for example, as a fact. That is belief as opposed to knowing. Which one of us here can positively say, this is, I'm not calling for an answer, but just consider this, do you know as a fact that God exists? Or do you believe that God exists? Or is it both? And if one or the other or both, which came first? Did knowledge of God come first or did belief of God come first? And we're going to see that in the life of Mary today. The difference between to know and to believe. If you would rise with me if you're able today, I'm going to read our, our main text today from the Gospel according to Luke in chapter 1. This will be verses 1 through 4 and verses 26 through 38. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And then he goes through and tells about um, John the Baptist, his conception, and the circumstances of his birth. And then we skip down to verse 26, where Christ's birth is announced to Mary. Verse 26, now in the sixth month of the angel Gabriel, in the sixth month, and that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy with John the Baptist, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, 
that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is a reading of the word of God. Lord, we thank you for this reading of your word and for this account, which is not a lengthy account, but it shows the faith of Mary. We ask you, God, to give us similar faith, as strong as the example of Mary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please have a seat. The lyrics of this song, Mary, Did You Know, and we're going to play it at the end as our closing song. We'll just have it up on the, uh, on the audio. But Mark Lowry asks these questions. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know? The blind will see and the deaf will hear. The dead will live again. The lame will leap. The dumb will speak. The praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect Lamb? The sleeping child you're holding is the great I Am. Mary? Did you know? Those are good questions. Those are good questions to ponder. Those of you who are, who are mothers of any kind, adoptive, stepmom, birth mom, you have a special bond that gives you an insight into this that we men can believe but not know. See, you know things about children and about motherhood and about childbirth that we men believe, but we can't know. For example, I could say, childbirth, ooh, I bet that hurts. (laughs) We've got an amen. Do I know, do I know, know that that hurts? I don't. Do I believe that it hurts? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For one thing, the Bible says that childbirth would be accompanied with pain. But if you've seen a woman in travail giving birth, you believe it. The signs are all there. But but can you really, really, as a man, can you really know it? Luke 1.26, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. There's a couple, couple things of note here. First off, this is a kind of a peasant girl. She's She's a a poor girl. She does not have high standing. She has no reason to expect that she would get special attention from an angel. And so this is a girl, let's assume she's never seen an angel before. I think I've talked to maybe a couple of people who believe that they have actually seen an angel before. It's exceedingly rare. 
And this angel comes and says, rejoice, highly favored one. Me, favored? I'm nobody. I'm from a small house in a small city. But the Lord is with you, and blessed are you among women. In other words, blessed are you even more so than all other women. And she's got to be thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's this all about? But the angel tells her that she is highly favored by God himself. Oh, I would love to hear that message from an angel spoken directly to my face. Hey, Ron, just want you to know, I'm Gabriel the angel, and I'm from the Lord with a message for you. You, are, you have found favor with God. Oh, that would be cool. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what the manner of greeting, what kind of manner of greeting this was. And that, so she's troubled. But she knows that the angel just said, you found favor with God. So, Mary, did you know? She knows she has favor with God. This we know that Mary knows. And Then the angel said to her, don't be afraid for Mary. And then he repeats himself, for you have found favor with God. Okay, this is twice now. The angel says, you have found favor with God. And behold, you will, here it comes, You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. Like, there's not even a pause between that. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. These are some some pretty big facts coming at her hard and fast. Mary, you found favor with God, and not only that, but you're going to conceive a son, and not only that, he's going to become the king of Israel, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his king, of his kingdom there will be no end. So remember David, whose kingdom ended? Yeah, you're going to conceive and bear a son who's going to be greater than David. Wow. Just wow. So she knew that she would conceive a son and he would be given the throne. Now, what has she got to be thinking at this point? Wow, I'm going to be the mother of the next king of Israel. And he's going to live in that castle that I visited down there in Jerusalem. And he's going to be like the political king of Israel. That's what it basically says here. If I'm, if I'm reading this in that context, in that time, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary just has one question. How can this be, since I do not know a man? I'm a virgin. How am I going to conceive? Okay, so for a virgin to conceive, it happens, by the way, in nature. It has never been documented in a human being. Documented. But it has been documented in other animals. This This is something called parthenogenesis. The Greek word parthenos, it means virgin. There's a temple in Athens, Greece called the Parthenon. It's the temple to the virgin God. Parthenos, parthenogenesis, genesis means birth or to give life. Parthenogenesis is bees do it all the time. It's just cloning. But here's the thing about cloning. All clones are always female through parthenogenesis. You can't, get a, you can't get a Y chromosome in there. It's where, a, it's where the female's egg activates and starts dividing as if there was the male's seed there, and it just starts dividing and becoming some. It's always a female every time. But you're a virgin, and you're going to conceive and bear a what? A son. How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit. So here's the answer. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Not just the King of Israel, but the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Elizabeth is a a kinswoman. Maybe she's a cousin, maybe she's an aunt. It doesn't say what kind of kin she is, but She's close enough that Mary would know who she is, and she's close enough, and she and Mary knows that Elizabeth is old. So this is not this is not your your aunt Elizabeth who's 35 years old old. 
This is like, this is your Aunt Elizabeth who's 65 years old. Like the impossible to conceive kind of old. The oldest uh, natural conception that I've been able to find on record is for a woman 53 years old in Britain to conceive a child naturally without any kind of scientific intervention. So this woman is probably beyond that. It's impossible for her to conceive, this Elizabeth. And Mary's, Mary's reaction is precious. Mary only speaks to us six times in all of Scripture. She appears 12 times. Her, her name is given 12 times. And she, uh, she appears in four settings, and she speaks exactly six sentences, six statements. So the first one, the first words of Mary, were, how can this be since I don't know a man? The second words of Mary, after it's all laid out for her, is, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Are these words to live by? Let it be to me according to your word. Verse 39, now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste. So she gets right on her donkey and she flies uh, to the hill country. We don't know exactly where it is. It's up in the mountains somewhere. She's like, Elizabeth, my, my old, old kinswoman, aunt, is... She's conceived, and she's going to bear a child? Like, she's old. I get, this I got to see. And so she goes with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. Mary confirms that, that Elizabeth is pregnant. Leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And from here on out in Scripture, you're going to see the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit just coming and just anointing people and doing miraculous things. And it's always about the Holy Spirit. And every time that something awesome happens, it's either there's an angel present or there's a prophet present or there's the Holy Spirit present. And, and sometimes it's all three. And then she spoke, and then it filled Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she spoke out with a loud voice, not a soft voice, a loud voice. So she's calling from across the room. Mary comes into the the house, and over there is Elizabeth. She calls out, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. How does she know? How does Elizabeth know? They didn't have telegraphs or phones. And Mary got with haste and went to the hill country. Faster than news could travel that Mary is pregnant, If Mary is pregnant now, she's pregnant by a few days, maybe. Maybe a week. This is before most women even know that they're pregnant. And Elizabeth looks from across the room far enough that she has to shout at her and says, Blessed is your womb. But why is this granted to me, Elizabeth, that the mother, she's pointing to a 16-year-old girl, the mother of my Lord, should come to me. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The Holy Spirit is just all over this place. There's just miracle after miracle happening here. Prophecy is happening. Word of knowledge is happening. And this babe who is six months conceived Leaps in the womb for what? For joy. That means there's some kind of cognition going on here in this babe. There's emotion going on in this unborn child. And this is one of the key central verses whereby the those who are who live a profoundly Christian life understand when that baby is in the womb, that is a human being. This baby leaped for joy. It's not a mass of cells. Cells don't leap for joy. This is a baby with a soul. And blessed is she who believed, that is, Elizabeth, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm telling you, Mary, blessed are you who believed, she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Elizabeth knows prophetically that somebody has already visited Mary and already promised her things from the Lord. 
what kind of things? That you will bear a son, and he shall be called the Son of God. And, and he shall sit on the throne of David, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary responds this way. Um, it's called the Song of Mary, but it says Mary said. So she's saying something, but it comes in a song format. So a little bit of confusion there. Uh, it, it's definitely composed like a song, but the words are prophetic. This is, this is the way prophets speak. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. What does Mary know? Mary, did you know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? Yes, I, Mary, admit today that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. This is a corrective to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is something held by the Roman Catholic Church, which is that Mary was conceived without sin and that Mary was sinless. And right here she's saying, I need a Savior. Well, why would a, why would a perfect, sinless person need a Savior? Mary knew. Mary, did you know that you're a sinner? Yes, I know that I'm a sinner and I am in need of a Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant, and I'm a lowly person. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. How do she know? By the way, it's okay to say, Blessed Mary. I used to say it all the time in the Catholic Church. And then when I became when I became, a, when I became converted and really took this faith on for myself, I stopped saying that because I was concerned about ascribing too much to Mary. But it says right here, blessed are you among women, and henceforth all generations will call me blessed. So, yes, blessed Mary. Even blessed mother. She is a blessed mother. Of course she's a blessed mother. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary, did you know? What did you know? I know that God is great, and I know that his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. And I know that he has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. These are not the words of an uneducated peasant girl. These are the words of a theologically astute, God-fearing young woman who's been taught the Scriptures, who's completely yielded in her heart to, to God and to the Holy Spirit. And the rich he has swept away, empty. And he's helped his servant Israel and in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Mary knows her Old Testament history. Mary's been trained in the Scriptures. And Mary remained with her, that is Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her house, to her house. And so that would put Mary at Elizabeth's house in the ninth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Did she stay and help in the birth? Well, I don't know. Women did that. Women do that in traditional societies, perhaps. Now here's an amazing thing. Mary stays long enough to begin growing a baby bump. And she doesn't stay in the hill country. She returns home where people know her, where people can look at her and say, ain't that a baby bump? But you haven't taken up house with Joseph yet. So Mary's stepping out in faith to return. And in Luke chapter 2, it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. From Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a, a manger, a feed trough, where you put hay and grain for the animals, because there was no room for them in the inn. Mary has just delivered a child that she didn't conceive with a man. There's only one person on earth at this point 
who knows absolutely for a fact that this is a child born to a virgin. Joseph believes it. Mary knows it. Because I am told that women remember when they have relations, their first relations with a man. Makes sense. That's something you don't forget. Mary's the only person on planet Earth who knew that this was a virgin birth. Knew for a fact. And she sees the baby born. What has that got to do to her mind and to her soul? I have never been with a man. And I have a baby here. This is of God. She's the only one who knows it in that real way. And now, this is unusual too, because uh, you're not going to find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, which is just a, like a long towel and wrapped, 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 like, like, a, like a turban, a piece of cloth that you might use for a turban, you know, wrap around your head several times like this. You wrap it around the baby, kind of bundle them all up, keep them, keep them all you know, tight and snug like that, and laid in an animal trough. I can almost guarantee you in, in that town in Bethlehem, there were probably not any other male children wrapped in swaddling cloth and laid in an animal trough. It's very, very unlikely. But this is exactly what the angel came and told the shepherds in the field. You're going to find a baby, and it's going to be some really unusual circumstances. Don't be afraid, the angel says. He comes to the shepherds. He says, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you in this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And so for the first time, he's called Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. It's a sign because it's very, very unusual. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a feed trough. And the shepherds are probably thinking, that just doesn't happen. Nobody wraps a baby and puts him in a feed trough. Nobody does that. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, what does that mean, a multitude of the heavenly host? Like the heavens open up, and there's thousands and thousands of people up there saying or singing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, so now the angels are gone, poof, that the shepherds said to one another, can you picture, what did we just see? Did you just see what I saw? I thought I saw 10,000 people up in heaven singing. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw it too. What should we do? Well, let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found, there's that coming with haste again. They came with haste right away, and they found Mary and Joseph, and guess what? The babe lying in a feed trough, just like the angels said. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And they also told Mary everything that they had seen. How do we know? Because A, they made it widely known, and B, the next sentence, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now this is said of Mary two times. Once is at the birth of Christ right here. She keeps these things and ponders them in her heart. What does that sound like that we would ever do? Meditation. Pondering the goodness of God. Thinking about it. So Mary is a woman of few words, as far as we can tell. But she's a woman of deep thought. And when the eight days were completed... For the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, and the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Mary believed the angel enough to call his name Jesus like she was told to. And then they go uh, into the temple, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And so here's that Holy Spirit again. The Holy Spirit keeps coming around, making the rounds. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, 
And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, you're letting your servant depart in peace now. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Here's a confirmation from a prophet in the temple that this child is where salvation is going to come from. Mary, did you know that your babe, your baby boy, would one day save you? This child that you delivered would one day deliver you? Which, of, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph, his mother, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. She's just getting hit left and right with amazing revelations about this child. She knows that this child was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. She knows that it was a virgin birth. Now she has other people coming and saying, this is the child that God told me about. This is the child that God told me about. And she, Mary, did you know? Mary's getting confirmation from all over the place that other people are coming and saying, that's the one, that's the one. And he's laying in a trough. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, now, Simeon is going to reveal something to uh, Mary that is hard news to hear. Something else that she's going to know. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Your son is going to be He's going to be perceived as a troublemaker. He's going, to be, he's going to be somebody who's going to not just live a quiet life of a carpenter's son. He's going to rock the world. And yes, here comes the hard news. Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary, this boy's going to bring you heartache. He's going to break your heart not because he will fail you, but because of what you will see. And then an old woman in the temple, Anna, she bears witness to the Redeemer as well and calls him the Redeemer. And then the family returns to Nazareth, Luke chapter 2, verse 39. So when they had performed all the things according to the law, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And this describes ages 8 days through 12 years, that he became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So Mary gets to see Jesus growing up, becoming spiritually strong, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God. Now, this is being spoken of a child who is younger than 12 years old. Which one of us has ever seen a little boy who was filled with wisdom, spiritually strong, and we would say he had the grace of God upon him. I have a lot of sons. I can't actually, I mean, it's no slam on them. But I can't actually say that my 9 and 10-year-old and 11-year-old sons were spiritually strong, filled with wisdom, and had the grace of God upon them. They were, they were little boys with ants in their pants. They were pretty rambunctious, and they needed to be disciplined from time to time. And they had their moments, but not Jesus. And then at age 12, Luke chapter 2, verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days and they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother didn't know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, probably a large caravan that traveled together for safety, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. It's like, I thought that Aunt Elizabeth, do you have the child? No, I don't have the child. Uncle Frank, do you have the child? No, I don't have the child. Oh boy, now we got to go back. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him, now, so it was that after three days, it took them three days, you know, a day traveling away, a day traveling back, and now they're looking for him for a day. And on the third day, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, which is, by the way, 
He's 12. Think about that. Sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Why would a 12-year-old boy be sitting in the temple asking questions and listening to teachers? It's a Jewish thing. He probably had the manhood ceremony in that temple that year. Bar mitzvah. A 12-year-old boy was a young man. He entered into adulthood. He takes his place, his rightful place, with the others who are learning the scriptures, and it kind of flew right by mom and dad. Kind of went right by him. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. We've been worried sick about you. And he said to them, Why? Why did you seek me? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Huh. Mary, mom, didn't you know? Did you know that I, I belong here? Apparently, Mary did not know. Or she forgot. I don't know how that happened. I don't know. She knew that, she, that he was conceived to a virgin, born to a virgin, and that many came and said, this is the Christ child. But didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? Now? So I asked myself the question, did Mary and Joseph, you know, when did they actually tell Jesus, by the way, Joseph is not your father. God is your father. I don't know. Did they tell him? Did they have a little talk? Like, you're adopted. <laughs> we don't know. There's no record of it here. But at this point, Jesus confirms this. I know. Joseph, I love you. You're not my father. I'm here about my father's business. And so this is kind of a correction to Mary. Jesus is telling Mary... This is where I belong. This is where I'm going to be. And now, now Mary knows this. She sees for the first time probably that Jesus will not just be a carpenter's son, although that's an honorable thing to be, even though he now has 18 years of carpentry in his future. He's going to spend the next 18 years being a carpenter at home and supporting his family probably. They didn't understand. They didn't understand this. This is the first time when it doesn't say, uh, you, might expect it, you might expect the scripture to say, Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. But it goes on to say, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Mary, did you know? The answer is no, I didn't know. And I don't get it. And I'm confused. And then when he went down with them and came to Nazareth, he was subject to them. He obeyed his parents, but, his, but now it says, his mother kept all these things in her heart. So they've had a several days' journey going back from Jerusalem back to Nazareth. And now she's keeping all these things in her heart. And again, Jesus increases in wisdom and stature and in favor with, all, with God and all men. So this describes Jesus from age 12 to 30. So we saw that Jesus increased in wisdom and favor from ages 8 days to 12 years. And now this is, says it again. It describes it. He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And for the second time now, Mary keeps these things and ponders them in her heart. And now we come to John chapter 2, and we're going to be closing up with this. John chapter 2, Mary, uh, Jesus is 30 years old now, we believe. And so his, his background as a carpenter, he's done his carpentry thing. And he's spent the last couple of days, the last three days actually, starting to gather disciples to himself. This is Jesus comes on the scene and he calls Nathaniel. He calls Andrew. And now on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. So, and Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, that is when the wedding uh, ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Why? 
Why would she say that? Well, because, we, because we're rich, Jesus. Just reach into that purse of silver you've got there and go out and buy more wine for the wedding. Or Jesus, we know how to, we know how to make, we know how to, uh, we know how to dis, not distill, what do you call it? Ferment. We know how to ferment wine, so go get a batch started. No, that would take a long time. There's only one reason that she would say to Jesus, they have no wine. She's putting something on him and expecting him to do something about it. Why? Has he ever done anything miraculous that we have any recording of yet? No. So what's going on in Mary's heart? Why would she tell him this? Mary, did you know? That your baby boy would turn water into wine. Did you know? Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? Literally in the Greek, it's this, which he spoke in Aramaic, but it's translated into the Greek this way. What to me and to you, woman. This term woman is a term of respect. It's not a term of derision or ridicule. It's a very respectful term. What to me and to you? Mary says, they have no wine. My translation, we can all kind of, Fill in the blank here a little bit, I think. My translation of that would be, Mom, I've got this. I've got this. I know what I'm doing. Different scholars have speculated about why Mary would say, would say uh, they have no wine, and then Jesus comes back in the next verse with, my hour has not yet come. Some say that Mary saw that the wine was running out, and it was almost gone, and that Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. And, and Jesus is looking, thinking, this is what some scholars think, Jesus is looking and thinking, I'll wait until they're out. Then my hour will come. But one thing about, about this that I think that we can be confident in is this is not an argument between mother and child. They are at peace with one another. This has been their relationship. And Mary, we see, by presenting this fact, they have no wine, Mary knows something. Or does she believe? And she says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Hmm. That's confidence. I was thinking, what kind of confidence would this be? And this picture came to me. I'm sorry, I see some things in sports analogies. So bear with me with a basketball analogy here. There's a story that I heard many, many years ago. I was pretty sure it was told about Joe Namath when he was in high school. Joe Namath was a great quarterback for the New York Jets uh, National Football League a long time ago. But he was also a really good basketball player in his high school in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. And the story was told like this, and it could have been told about another person if I'm remembering incorrectly, but I believe it was him. It was, a, it was a game coming down to the end, and Beaver Falls was down by one point. The clock is ticking down. There's a couple seconds left on the clock. Beaver Falls High School gets the basketball. Somebody passes it out to, the, to Joe Namath, and he's got, he's got like 10 seconds on the clock, and he just dribbles that ball and he's just kind of dribbling calmly, and they're down by one point. They're going to lose the game. And he, he brings it down to half court, just a little more than half court, and, and they're saying, pass the ball, Joe, pass the ball. Get it under the basket. We need to get a basket. And he just keeps dribbling and dribbling from way far out. And it's five, four, three, two, and he's dribbling like this, one. And then the, Joe just does a set shot, shoots like that from about 40 feet away, and as the ball is arcing through the air, the buzzer sounds. And he turns around like this and puts up two fingers with his back to the ball. Swish. The ball swishes through the basket. Two points, they win by one point. That's confidence.
and God forgive me, I look at Mary. They have no wine, son. Woman, what is that between you and me? Why are you telling me this? And she turns away from Jesus. Here's how I see it in my mind's eye. She turns away from Jesus, looks at the servants, and says, do whatever he tells you to do. And she walks away like this. <laughs> That's how I see it. I'm sorry. I like basketball. Did she know? I think she knew. I think right here, this point, this is when she gets it. This is when Mary knows my son is the son of God. There's nothing he cannot do. Do whatever he tells you to do. Whatever he says, you do that. And this closes us with the best advice in all of Scripture. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Mary, I think you knew. Are we good with our song? We're going to close and we're going to play this song. We don't have video on it. This is, by Pent this is the Pentatonix version. Give all credit to Mark Lowry and Buddy Green for writing this song. This is the Pentatonix version of Mary, Did You Know? And just listen to those lyrics and think about what Mary knew and how it became belief and what that has to do with your heart. Do you know that he is the Son of God? Do you believe it? Do you believe it to the point that you can turn away and hold up two fingers, swish, like that?